Good morning. This is Bio 109. We're going to do a plant community lab this morning. Um, and uh, we have uh, Marley helping us as a biologist, and Jill and Stephanie are the camera crew. Um, so, one thing that biologists study are plant communities, and uh, as we know, there are different kinds. There's forests and there's deserts and so on and so on. And you can get to a smaller scale and uh, see variation within those broad categories as well. Um, we're going to look at three little communities here on the West Campus grounds. Uh, and we're going to be pursuing a hypothesis, testing a hypothesis uh, uh, that's in answer to our question how does variation in the availability of water affect plant communities? Um, and uh, uh, so uh, to do that, if you look at your worksheet, so there's a worksheet posted online that goes with this lab, so take a look at that and you can see we've developed some hypotheses to answer that question and some predictions associated with both the alternate and the null hypothesis. So from there we proceed to experimental design and that's what I'm going to lay out for you right now. So as I said we're going to look at three plant communities that that are very close to each other all on West Campus grounds but they differ in the extent of availability of water. So site one, which is where I'm at, uh, has rainfall only and maybe a little bit of runoff down the slope. Site two, which we'll get to next, is a small wash that gets rainfall plus uh, accumulated water that's flowing down the, the slope itself or the wash itself. And then site three is the biggest wash of all. It gets a huge amount of water that runs off of two very big parking lots. So it gets this huge flush of water. So we'll look at each of those in turn and try and characterize the plant community for them. Now, how do we characterize a plant community is the next question. You can <clears throat> make a plant list and that's useful but uh, it's a, just a checklist and it doesn't answer some other questions like what plants are the most common, uh, what plants are, I'll say for lack of a better word, the most dominant. And another issue that everybody, every researcher wants when they're assaying things is we want a fairly unbiased uh, estimate of what's there. <clears throat> so. I'll talk about that as we start laying out our transect. This is site one. And you can see it's pretty open. Uh, and we are about to run a transect through this site. Okay, this is a transect tape. We're going to be using the centimeter side, the metric system, not the inches side. Um, and it runs out for 50 meters, but we're only going to do 20 because that's all we need. And Marley's going to take this end of it and she's going to run out uh, till I tell her we're at 20 meters. So take it away. You're getting close, Marley. Oh, you're 20. 20? Yeah, you're 20. Um, and come back about three feet to me. There we go. That's great. Okay, so now, since there's just the two of us here, I'm gonna put this down on the ground, but this is our 
This is meter one, or the start of our tape right here. And we will start walking it. So we've laid out our transect, it's 20 meters long. And now what we're going to do is assay the plants that intersect with or intercept uh, the transect line. So that means any plant with vegetation uh, hanging over our transect line, we're going to identify any plant where the transect line is laying over the top of the plant, we'll identify. So we're going to identify each plant that fits that those criteria. And then the second thing we're going to do, uh, and we'll count. So uh, if we get more than one individual of the same species, we'll count each one. Uh, and then the other uh, consideration is coverage. We want to know uh, how much say biomass each plant uh, species exhibits in this uh, plant community. So to do that, what we'll do is we'll stand over the plant and measure the length of the plant that covers or is underneath the transect. Okay? So in this case, we've got a creosote this branch is not covering over it, so we're not counting now. So um, Marley's going to extend a second tape, which is going to make it easier for us to measure these things. So I'll go pull it to my end. And we're done. Okay, that's a... Uh... Oh. Yeah, so we'll just match it against the tape. Oh. So to do this the easy way, I think, is uh, figure out where you've got the tape against this. See, we have an inch tape. That's the problem. So uh, what number meter are you at? Um, just over 18. Okay, so... This is, we're going to say this is uh, 1.25 meters. Mm -hmm. so I'm at 19.25. Okay. All right, so we mark that down. Ouch. One creosote, 1.25, and that's meters. We'll convert. Uh, so we've done one plant. This little brittle bush is out of the running, so we're not going to count him. Um, we've got the tiniest. Get here. Back up. Um, so we've got the tiniest bit of rattan plant right here. This one you might remember from last week too. This is the hemiparasitic plant that likes to grow near creosote because it uh, helps itself to what the creosote roots have drawn up. But we've got just a little bit over, hanging over, or underneath the tape. And, uh, there he is, one ratney, and I'm gonna say five centimeters. Five centimeters. Okay, we move on to the next one. Okay, and this is um, triangle leaf bursage. If you remember from last week when we were at Feliz Paseos, they were a lot greener. Okay, so uh, here they may not have gotten quite as much rain. Got a little bit of greenery here. This plant, as pathetic as it looks, is still alive. So we're going to measure it. We're going to count it. So uh, where's that guy? There it is. That one we can do from here, so that's 10, 20, 30 centimeters, I'm going to say. Good. And the next plant that intercepts here is another triangle leaf bursage, a little bit bigger. Let's see from there. 30, 40, 
Continue on. Free us out again. So this bush is this wide. Only 10 centimeters happens to cover our transect. So we're a little further along on our transect line and uh, we're at this clump of plants. We actually have two plants here and one of the complexities, I guess I'll say, of collecting data like this is if you're in a situation where two plants are growing closely together and that's very common in the desert as we know. It's a good way for one plant to get shade from another. So this plant right here is a fairy duster plant. Uh, there's, uh, it's an ID plant in either plants one or plants two. When it blooms, it has this pinkish puff ball of, uh, it's mostly anthers, not, not petals. Uh, but it's a very common desert plant. Uh, and uh, we're gonna measure it in. So can you tell me where we should start there? Yeah, um, let's see, this is a, 50. Okay. So 10, 20, 30, 40. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Okay. 40. So fairy duster, one, 40 centimeters. Now, right next to it, kind of uh, in the mixed in, is another triangle leaf bursage, this lighter colored guy. And what do you think, Marley? Uh, I would start that here at like okay. 80. There's one leaf that comes yeah. out. 40, I'm going to say 50, okay, so we've got these two and we're going to proceed further down the transect line. So we've just finished the transect for site one, uh, we've uh, collected data on several plants and now what we're going to do is roll up our tape and walk to site two which is just a uh, few hundred feet away to the south. But we're gonna see a slightly different community there. We're at site two now, and a small wash runs from uphill over here, kind of diagonally downhill towards the campus buildings. So at this site, at site two, we have a bit more water uh, in the form of runoff than we did at site one. Uh, we are starting in what you could consider to be a region identical to what we saw at site one, and that's partly because of some slope effects. So on this side, this uh, slope faces south. That means it's hotter and drier than the far bank over there, which faces north. And we're gonna see as we walk, it won't show up on our transect data, but we'll see it as we walk, there's a difference in vegetation. The north facing slope in desert regions tends to be lusher uh, with bigger plants of the same species uh, than the south facing slope and sometimes plants uh, that can't take this kind of dry condition will be on the north facing slope. So Marley's going to start walking and I'll tell her when she's at 20 meters. Okay, we're at 20, Marley. 
Okay. I'm going to pull backwards just a little bit. Well, actually, don't worry about that. ready to collect data. So this is a new plant uh, in our experience. This is uh, a wolfberry. The genus name is Lysium. There are several species in Arizona. It has tiny little flowers that, believe it or not, attract hummingbirds. And it has fruits that also attract birds. Little yellow, or reddish or orange ones uh, later on in the year. So this one we have at 1.1 meter on our transect intercept. Okay. So we're about seven meters along our 20 meter transect right now, and we've come across a plant that we haven't seen on our transects either one or two yet today, and that's um, Foothills Palo Verde, uh, which we talked about extensively uh, last week at Feliz Paseos. Um, and this one uh, covers a, jeez, oh, I didn't write it down. Huh. Foothills Palo Verde, so did you remember? Uh, it's about 30 centimeters. Okay, so this one, uh, we only have a little bit uh, over our, under our transect, so just 30 centimeters out of this good sized plant. We saw one of these plants on transect number one. Uh, this is a white thorn acacia. Uh, tiny, tiny, doubly pinnate leaves, and on some individuals, straight, uh, bright white thorns. Um, this one's a bit bigger than the one we saw on the dry slope. Um, and that's probably because it's closer to the uh, course of the wash itself. This is another species we haven't encountered before. This is a little plant called paper flower. This one's about as big as it gets. Um, and it's called paper flower because the uh, dried flowers persist as these little tan uh, flowers. When they're in full bloom, they're almost a neon yellow. Very, very pretty plant. Um, but this is the first one we've seen in either site one or site two. So we've completed site two and now we're about to walk over towards site three. We're at site three now, and this site gets more water than either site one or site two. And the reason is it's being fed by two very large parking lots on the south side of uh, West Campus. So all the water runs off from those uh, non-absorbent asphalt parking lots. It gets funneled uh, into this drainage area right here, crosses this apron, and empties into the largest, uh, the larger of our two washes. So we're gonna expect some differences in the plant community because of this as we take a kind of uh, panning look at this particular community, you can see right off the trees look bigger, much bigger. Okay, so site three is a, a brushy site and it's hard to see what's going on. So I'm gonna introduce a couple of plants here before we uh, dive in. Um, and the first one here is a Mexican Palo Verde, not native to uh, Arizona. Uh, it has very, this is, it has really long leaves with tiny, tiny leaflets, lots and lots of tiny leaflets. Um, so you can easily distinguish it from the other two Palo Verdes. Right behind me and over my head, 
is a blue Palo Verde. You can see the a color difference. You can see the slightly larger, maybe you can see the slightly larger leaflets. And just out of uh, arm's length is a Foothills Palo Verde. We met the blue and we met the foothills last week at Feliz Paseos. Uh, so you should be familiar with them. So this foothills has found itself growing in a uh, fairly wet region, more wet than uh, you usually find it, but it looks fairly happy. So I'm going to thread the tape through to Marley so she doesn't break her neck. Here it comes. Okay. And so if you could shy over that yeah. way, that'd be great. And we're going to run it out for another 20 meters. We're in the middle of the Site 3 transect, so somewhere around 10 meters. And we're also right in the middle of this large wash. And I wanted to comment on a couple of things. One is if you look behind me, you see very little in the way of green plants. There's some small ones down here. A lot of these look like uh, baby Palo Verdes of some kind. And they're all at risk because the next time a big storm comes through with say a foot of water here and rocks being moved and sand and gravel being moved, these little guys can get scoured out of existence. So they're going to have to be lucky if they're going to persist long enough to become a big tree. You can see by this debris pile behind me also that uh, that gives you a sense of the force of the water. Uh, it's hard to tell today because it's overcast, but it's nice and cool and shady in here. And that's because, as we'll see from the data, uh, a lot of the plants here are good-sized trees and their canopies overlap uh, across our transect and give us quite a bit of shade. For a lot of desert plants, uh, sunlight is in abundance. But down here, for any plant growing down here, sunlight becomes a scarce resource. Plenty of water, but not much light, and that will affect who lives here and who does not. So we're at the end of the tape for Site 3, the Site 3 transect. Uh, I want to familiarize you with one tree that we recorded along the length of the transect, but this is a good view of it. This is a plant called African Sumac, and it has a compound leaf um, that consists of three elongated leaflets. And it shares this characteristic with another member of this family, Roos, which is um, poison ivy. This one, I've handled it with no trouble, um, but uh, it is in the same family. This one's in fruit, and it actually has little round berries, very like what you'd find on poison ivy at the right time of year. This plant is considered invasive. Uh, it especially tends to uh, occur in wet areas like this big wash uh, and it is capable of crowding out natives. So we're outside of uh, our transect line but there's a couple of plants here that we haven't seen before and I thought I'd show you them. This one we see here twining up on this blue Palo Verde is a milkweed vine and it is employing the kind of strategy that a lot of vines use. Rather than utilizing energy to make cellulose, that is wood, to support their uh, body, I guess you'd call it, uh, they instead climb up other plants. So this blue Palo Verde is uh, inadvertently acting like a trellis. Um, it is a true milkweed. We can see some pods here, okay. Uh, here's one down here that's split open and we see some uh, fluff coming out 
and it's got a modest little uh, cluster of flowers here. Pretty hard to see, but insects can find them. And this plant does have at least one flower. Uh, right now, it probably flowered more earlier. It's a little cluster of flowers, and these flowers produce pollen in tiny little packets. And when an insect comes to pollinate, uh, its leg slips between a groove on the flower, and uh, basically this little pollinium, as it's called, locks onto the insect's leg. So it's like a, uh, a shackle or something. And when it goes to another flower, it's able to dislodge it. Um, but uh, the milkweed is not taking any chances regarding getting its pollen attached to a pollinator. So this dead plant is of some interest. This is London Rocket. It's also not native. Uh, it tends to grow in wetter areas. This plant spreads very rapidly and very easily. And uh, in some places where it's really gotten a foothold, uh, you see nothing but. Uh, but one thing that you may have noticed as I've talked about plants in site three is I keep saying non-native. Okay? When you look at the data, you'll see that reflected in our data collection. This one's also off our transect, but I wanted to show it to you. So here's another plant that's near site three, but not on our transect. This is desert broom. Uh, it tends to have um, straight stems and uh, kind of straight slender leaves. And often it's a brighter green than many other desert plants. This one's not in flower right now, and it does have a little bit of milkweed growing on it. Um, desert broom likes added water, but this one doesn't happen to be benefiting from uh, water running through the big wash. Instead, it's getting water that's running off the uh, parking lot directly behind me. Uh, but it's a pretty common desert plant. If you're, if you're ever hiking through the desert, you're likely to see this one. So we've just finished up site three, uh, and I hope you've been able to see just by watching the video that as we've gone between sites one, two, and three, we see some dramatic differences in plant communities uh, uh, because of the variation in the amount of water each of these plant communities received. We saw changes or differences in the number of species found at each site, differences in the amount of coverage, in other words, an index of how big the plants were, and maybe something that seems a little bit surprising, but we saw differences in uh, how common natives and non-natives were in each of the three sites. Um, so in addition to our eyeballing differences in these sites, we collected some data which gives us, and this is the essence of science, uh, more precise descriptions of what we saw. Um, and it gives us data that we can subject to uh, statistical tests to even further crystallize what we see. So uh, that ends uh, this week's lab, and thank you for watching.